my name is Jeff. Um, I'm a user experience designer and, and design manager. I, uh, I work for Acquia, as the slide suggests. And um, I've been doing uh, user experience design for about 17 years. Um, most of that time, uh, my work has been focused on creating web applications versus websites. So in those web applications, it's largely uh, role-based, uh, permissions-based, uh, profile-based, so not unlike Drupal. So Drupal was a, was a pretty good fit. Um, in addition to being a user experience designer, I'm also a design manager. So I, I, uh, I've spent a lot of time um, working with companies, building user experience departments, and making sure that design and user experience fits within engineering and product uh, and marketing. Um, and um, in that time, I've learned that uh, selling design is, is really hard. Um, and that uh, most, most of my customers, uh, albeit in, in through the freelance world or through um, working for the different companies I worked for, I've just learned that um, I've learned that uh, customers have certain expectations on design. Like uh, they sort of think design is uh, just brand, the, the thing at the end that makes that makes pretty pictures, or that makes a pretty interface that ties on to the end. And um, so a lot of my work is trying to like convince them that's that's not necessarily the case. And I think some of their some of their obstacles that I've hit is that they. Um, like I said, they they map design to something uh, to you know like a just visual design. But additionally, on top of that, they see deliverables and user experience like uh, usability testing, and and they have preconceived notions and ask questions like, why would I do usability testing when I have QA? Do I have, do I have to pay for both of those, or why would I do design research? Um, because I've done the business analysis, I've done the competitive analysis, and uh, because of that, I can accurately represent the user. So I don't really want to extend my timeline and pay for uh, design research or, research or usability testing. And so being a design manager is a lot of uh, solving uh, problems like that and, um, and ultimately trying to avoid situations where you have interfaces like this. <laughs> so, um, you know, I got to, you know, as, as bad as this looks, I got to give a, f a few props back to Microsoft, believe it or not. I mean, it, took, it takes a lot of work to build a UI like this. You actually have to go in and, and assemble all kinds of uh, toolbars. Uh, but the thing I find interesting about it is, like, if you look at all the redundancies in here, I think you see things like uh, the checkbox mod thing, the checkbox little control here. I think it probably shows up like three times, you know. So there's this. They haven't done the work for uh, solving the redundancies in the UI. Uh, and uh, but I also think that uh, even though this isn't the default out of the box experience, it paints a really good picture in terms of. Um, in a general uh, design rule, which is you know try to focus on the 80%. Uh, in this case, you know using Microsoft Word, your 80% is to create a document, bullets, you know justification, italics, uh, and so your 80% is down here. You know you type in this little tiny place, versus your 20% is all this other stuff. You know so it's uh, it's. <laughs> It's exactly reverse of what you'd expect in a, in a user interface. But again, uh, props to Microsoft and the fact that uh, most of the time they did lead with the 80%. Uh, you, none of these toolbars show on the surface. Um, so um, about, um, about 10 years ago, I watched this video that um, that NBC produced, um, where they interviewed IDEO. Does everybody know IDEO, the company IDEO? Not many. So IDEO is um, it's a company in Santa Clara, California. And um, you're probably all using IDEO products. Uh, they're probably the most successful uh, product design company in the world. Uh, they've designed things like uh, the, uh, the, well, they designed the original mouse. 
Um, they also designed, uh, you remember the toothpaste things there? We always had to screw on the cap of the toothpaste and it always made a mess. And, well, they designed it so that you can stand a toothpaste bottle straight up and a flip top cap, just general things. Um, and uh, <clears throat> when I watched this video, um, I realized that the video does uh, an awful lot in terms of uh, painting a really great picture in terms of solving the obstacles that I was having with, uh, with my clients, uh, albeit in freelance or through jobs. Um, they do a really good job at, um, at showing uh, the value of, um, of creating an end-to-end -end user experience process. And the thing that's interesting about them is that um, they, uh, in this video, they were asked to do this in, in five days' time. And because they're so successful, it's really kind of hard, hard to argue with their design process. So it's, it's, uh, the, the video series itself is actually like um, an hour long. Um, obviously, I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I've, I've cut it down to its bare bones. But if you're interested in creating a culture that, uh, that fosters innovation, I highly suggest you uh, try to find the series and watch the whole thing because it's just, it's just a brilliant video. Here was the premise of the program. We went to IDEO, the product design folk, and said, take something old and familiar, like say the shopping cart, and completely redesign it for us in just five days. Nine in the morning, day one, and these people have a deadline to meet. So welcome to the kickoff of the shopping cart project. This is Palo Alto, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, and these are designers at IDEO, probably the most influential product development firm in the world. We're kind of experts on the process of how you design stuff. So we don't care if you give us a toothbrush, a toothpaste tube, a tractor, a space shuttle, you know, a chair, it's all the same to us. We, like, want to figure out how to innovate in, in, by using our process, applying it. And so for the next five days, the team will apply that process to bringing the supermarket shopping cart into the 21st century. The team splits into groups to find out firsthand what the people who use, make, and repair shopping carts really think. Okay, go. The problem with the plastic cart is the wind catches it. Yeah. And these things uh, have been clocked at 35 across the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's actually a pretty good point. The, the trick is to find these real experts and so that you can learn much more quickly than you could by just kind of doing it in the normal way and, and trying to learn about it yourself. From everything I read, these things aren't that safe either, you know? Right. Um, so probably the seat itself is going to have to be redesigned. What you're seeing here is the kind of social science, like anthropologists, you know, like you go and study tribes. What is it that, that they do that we can learn from that will help us design a better cart? One of the interesting things for me is looking at how people really don't like to let go of the cart, except for the professional shopper, whose strategy is to leave the cart at various places. Each team is going to demonstrate and communicate and share everything that they've learned today. Um, people went off into the four corners of the earth and are coming back with the golden keys to the to innovation. A uh, shopping cart has been clocked at 35 miles an hour traveling through a parking lot in the wind. We were in the store, what, two hours? And, and it was truly frightening just to see the kind of stuff going on. You ought to designate some people to make damn sure that the store owner's point of view is represented. After nine straight hours, the team is tired. They call it a day. Day two and the start of IDEO's unique brand of brainstorming. They call it a deep dive, a sort of total immersion in the problem at hand. IDEO's mantra for innovation is written everywhere. One conversation at a time, stay focused, encourage wild ideas, defer judgment, build on the ideas of others. Uh, that's the hardest thing for people to do is to uh, restrain themselves from uh, uh, criticizing an idea. So if anybody starts to nail an idea, they get the bell. The deep dive begins, and for the next few hours, the ideas pour out and are posted on the walls. Oh, the blind, the, the privacy blind. Like when you're buying six cases of condoms, you, no one sees. It's more nesting. Is, uh, it, it sort of has to nest. If it doesn't nest, we don't have a solution. Oh, Velcro pants and, and Velcro seats for the kids, and you just drop them down on there. And like, like the Velcro seats? <laughs> Velcro pants for kids? Yeah, see, uh, you have to have some wild ideas. If, then you build on those wild, wild ideas, and they end up being 
uh, better ideas than if you said, if, you, if everybody only came up with sane things, you know, kind of appropriate things, you'd never, like, have any points to take off to, to build a, a really innovative idea. It's organized chaos. Organized chaos. It's not organized. Um, what it is is it's focused chaos. By 11 a.m., the group begins narrowing down the hundreds of ideas written or drawn on the walls. How? By voting for them. Vote with your post-it, not, not with an idea that's cool, but with an idea that's cool and buildable. Okay, Peter, we're done. Back at the shop, it is 6 o'clock. The four mock-ups are ready for showing. Baskets also can be, if you think you will have more volume, baskets can be put in. A modular shopping cart you pile hand baskets onto. A high-tech cart that gets you through the traffic jam at checkout. That you could mount a scanner on the shopping cart so that you, as the customer, as you pull it off the shelf, would scan each item. One that's built around child safety, and another that lets shoppers talk to the supermarket staff remotely. Uh, yeah, where can I find a yogurt? But the adults, again, decide more work needs to be done before the mock-ups can be combined into one last prototype. Why don't we have all the cards come up here for a second? I think you take a piece of each one of these ideas and kind of back it off a little bit and then put it in the yeah, in the right. design. The design is still not there, but there's another motto at IDEO, fail often in order to succeed sooner. And some of the team will be up half the night trying to put together a design that finally does work. Um, so, there it is! There it is! <laughs> so we took the best elements out of each prototype, designed this entire cart in a day, and then this cart was fabricated in a day with an amazing team of people in our machine shop pulling this off, working in shifts throughout the night. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> <laughs> the cart, which is designed to cost about the same as today's carts, is different in every other way. Hand baskets that stack in a metal frame and major improvements for all. You, you just lift the handle up, you drop the, you put the children in, and then you can close the... Um, the, the uh, handle right over them and they instantly have some little bit of a work surface that they can play with. What do you think? <laughs> this is, uh... Well, I, I'm very proud of the team. I think it's, it's great. This, does this work for you? Works for me great. Yeah. It's also beautiful. I mean, let's, you know, take it over to a local supermarket and see what they say. Yeah, it works really well. No. The cart's wheels turn 90 degrees so it can move also sideways. sideways. No more lifting up the rear in a tight spot. And you shop in a totally different way. Rather than taking your cart everywhere you go in the store, through a crowded store like this, uh, much more efficient to take a small basket, rush around to where the, the uh, particular shelves are, and come and back and put them back. Put them here and treat this as like a center for your shopping. And with a high-tech scanner, so that in the future you skip the checkout traffic jam. Here's how you would scan an item. You'd reach over and pick up anything like, uh, like the salad dressing, and I would, I would scan it, and if I want to accept that item, I would just press plus and then drop it in my basket. Because stores don't yet have those high-tech scanners the team designed, checking out today means doing it the old-fashioned way. But the bags are hung on hooks on the cart's frame. Remember, there is no basket here. Why get rid of the big basket? The basket is tyranny. The basket is tyranny because it's not really needed. If all your stuff ends up in bags, why need the basket in the first place? The Talk basket. to me about theft. There's no value in this cart without the basket because you can't carry anything in it. It's useless to anybody. You can't use it as a barbecue. So it's not going to get stolen. That's right. So this ought to appeal to store owners. Though. Yes. I love it. I think it looks yeah. great. At yeah. first, I was a little shocked, but I think it's you have some fantastic ideas here. It needs a little refining, but I think that it's great. I mean, we would, we would want them. It makes us feel great. Uh, and she also gave us some really good comments about how we can make this thing better. So here's why I like that. Number one, they went out and uh, they basically assumed that I don't, I don't know what people who need shopping carts need. You know, I, if I was to just tackle this without doing contextual inquiry or anything, I might just look at just shoppers and maybe streamline the shopping cart. But by doing contextual inquiry, they learned that um, safety is a concern, that, that speed across these things, across the parking lots is a concern, 
that uh, theft is a concern. They learned that uh, the, the regular shopper, which is probably your default expectation, and if you were to do this yourself, is like, I'm just gonna design this for the shopper, that that's not the only actor, that, that, there's, that there's the store owner, there's the guy that pushes the cart, there's the shopper, there's the professional shopper. Um, in addition to that, they basically were able to um, brainstorm on all different kinds of ideas really rather rapidly and on top of that, they basically said, a design is not good enough. I have to actually use it. I have to prototype it. I have to play with it. I have to understand how it works. Um, and, and then after that, they brought it to market to see how that prototype actually works, which is uh, pretty much a user experience design process on the web today. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that all of this work was done in five days, and not a single ounce of money or, ounce of mo or any money was spent on manufacturing. So they now have a design that's completely validated. They know it works for their target and nothing has been spent on engineering, which I think is just phenomenal. So there's uh, like, um, I don't know how old the study is. I think it was uh, 2006, IEEE uh, did a study on why software fails. And they basically said something along the lines of uh, overall, one trillion dollars is spent on IT. And of that one trillion dollars, 15% of all projects fail because of a lack of requirements. And on top of that, 50% of that is work that's unavoidable. And then last, fixing an error that happens after something has been manufactured costs 100 times more than that as if it was found ahead of time. And so these guys have fixed all of those problems in something that actually took manufacturing, you know, like that. I mean, they had machine presses and everything to build that thing. Uh, and so they've solved all of these problems. And if we can do that on the web, imagine how much money we could actually save. So this statement seems so obvious. Um, is written by uh, Whitney Hess of Happy Cog, who is a really wonderful interaction designer that basically says, to find the right solution, the how, we need to prioritize the features we invest in, the what, and to determine our priorities, we need to define the, the problem, the why. And to define the problem, we need to aden identify the intended audience, which read backwards means you pretty much have to know who you're designing for in order to understand what their problems are in order to come up with solutions to those problems in order to execute against them. And despite how elementary that sounds, I see over and over and over and over and over and over and over again people that cannot do this. So let's transition a little bit into the web and, and the types of things we're doing at Acquia um, to try to, um, well, I guess not all of us is at Aquaway, but uh, it's the things that I advocate for and, and try to do. Um, some of the stuff doesn't quite make sense in Aquaway, but I've included it because uh, different products uh, may require this more so than ours. Uh, so identifying the who and the why. Who's using your software and what problems are they having? Or why do they need a solution? The first one is pretty much what we saw in, um, in the video, which is contextual inquiry. It was a, I think the video was a little dark. I couldn't tell from where I was standing. It was the one the, where they had it in, in, in a quad section. And it's basically uh, field researchers that uh, are rooted in ethnography or anthropology that, that go out and observe people um, and try to understand what their natural behaviors are. Um, it's really good for um, fleshing out the why, or in the case of the shopping cart, we can just go to the shopping, uh, uh, go to a grocery store, also understand, you know, the who, who who's using it, and, and what problems are they are they facing. In terms of the cost, uh, I mean, it depends. It depends on whether you're going to do this yourself and just go and observe, or, but basically, it comes down to you know something like some moderator or. Uh, a field researcher, I'll see up above, I have one to two moderators. Um, and if it's, if you have to compensate the participant, it's, you know, 50, 75 to dollars to, to compensate them. Again, in the case of the, uh, of the grocery store, there is no compensation. You just gotta go there and observe and figure out how people are shopping. 
um, surveys. Kind of goes without saying, but um, a, you know, surveys are another way to kind of reveal um, why people are having problems on uh, on your site. Um, I, it's not, you know, even though I say it's good for flushing out who, it's it's not the best for flushing out who. But if you do lead your surveys with things like, you know, what uh, what's your primary role, then you may learn through doing a survey of your software that uh, maybe who's using your software is different than you expected. Um, I've listed on the side this whole presentation is kind of formatted this way. There's these different mm -hmm. services or tools that I use. Uh, some of them I know uh, a little bit more of than others. Some of them I actually learned through creating this presentation. And the ones on the, you know, with the arrows pointing to them are tools that I use uh, or we use uh, regularly. Um, so Wufu and SurveyMonkey have been around for a long time. You probably know about those. They, you know, just good survey with a lot of good analysis. Uh, Drupal Gardens has web forms built into it, so that's also really good for doing uh, some some basic surveys. The analysis needs to come up to the other tools, but still, uh, still good good things. Zoomerang is a lot like uh, a lot like Wufu or SurveyMonkey, except uh, I think they give you two more questions for free over Wufu. So like Wufu, you get ten questions, a hundred response uh, for free, versus Zoomerang, you get twelve questions, a hundred response. Um, interviews are probably my favorite method of coming up with um, an interface. And it's basically, it's just a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one interview with the experts of your of uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. So, um, how many of you guys have used Views three? Yeah. So Views three was uh, a good portion of it was my design, and the way that I did that was. Um, it was actually one of my favorite recent projects, just because working for Aqua, we have we have a staff of people that train people in Drupal. We have a staff of people that help people with their problems, and we also have a staff of people that kind of go on scene and you know get people you know up and up and running on these things. So I had experts all around me on this views project, and so it's really just sitting with them, learning about their problems, uh, learning about their desires. Um, and you know, taking all that analysis and boiling it up and being like, okay, well, 80% of the people wanted these particular features, and therefore, um, that's that's what we're going to build. Uh, unfortunately, there's no services or tools. It's just a matter of uh, you know using your time to to schedule it and make it happen. Usability tests. So I'll cover this more later when we get down and start talking about uh, the, the what and coming up with ideas. But it's basically just if you have a product already, it's really just you know asking people to go through your product and understanding where the pain points are of those products. Um, there's two different types of tests, which, I, which I'll cover more later too, which is moderated versus self-moderated. And then there's actually a third one called static self-moderated. And then, of course, there's analytics, right? Um, probably everybody's using analytics if you're on the web. Um, you know, some of the popular ones, uh, Google Analytics, which is probably what most people use. But uh, Crazy Egg is another uh, another really interesting tool. Um, crazy, what Crazy Egg does is uh, it it has well, it has a bunch of different things. But the two things that I think are most interesting about Crazy Egg is um, it provides heat maps that show where are people clicking and where are they scrolling. Um, are they actually scrolling all the way down and, or, or not and missing important content? Uh, but where it gets really interesting is it understands the data that's coming to the site. So if you searched, uh, let's say you were using Aquia.com as an example, if you had Crazy Egg installed and somebody came to Aquia.com uh, and had searched for Drupal, well, it'll provide a heat map that's based on that search criteria. And so you can see where people are clicking um, based on that search versus if they had come into Acquia using Yahoo and searched uh, on CMS or something. Maybe they're the same clicks, maybe they're, maybe they're not the same. Um, I guess one thing uh, to note about uh, analytics is um, a lot of people pay an awful lot of attention to, um, 
to unique page views, um, which you know obviously can tell you some things, but there's there's things that you got to watch out there, watch out for there too, and that um, just because your site bumps up and you're getting more traffic, it doesn't necessarily you know translate to uh, exactly maybe what you wanted. Um, I think there's a lot of work to, to define uh, the metrics that you want to use in your site. So, for, exa for example, um, again, page spikes, uh, uh, page spikes doesn't necessarily uh, mean what you want it to. Maybe if, you're do a, if, maybe if you look for number of uh, comments or something like that, that could tell you a little bit more about loyalty or number of comments by, um, by the same user. That could tell you a little bit more about loyalty, too. Um, and then there's other things that come into question, like what's more valuable, somebody that comes to your site every single day for 10 minutes, or somebody that comes to your site for four hours um, and leaves and goes and tells all his friends about, about, uh, about, the, about the product. That latter one, you're not going to be able to get through analytics. So if you're going to use analytics, a lot of these other things come into play too. Like you may get that information through a usability test where they get done doing it, some tests and they're so ecstatic about the product and they, maybe they tell you, I'm gonna go tell everybody about this. So analytics is only one form of method to kind of understand uh, what problems might you have on your site. Oops, I lost my control here. So what? You know, now we uh, now we know who is using our product and and what problem or, or why they're having problems, why there's a need to to do anything here. Now we kind of got to understand what are we going to do for them. What's what's the process of arriving at various different solutions? One way that we use is uh, using design principles, and a design principle is uh, is sort of a guardrail to the design process. Um, so I've listed Acquia's design principles on the right here. Uh, actually, these are, pr yeah, they, they're, they're for pretty much every product. I was going to say they're mostly for Drupal Gardens, but I think they're for every product. Um, and so, you know, a really good example is, um, let's say you're um, trying to figure out whether you want to add a feature or, um, or not. You've got a couple people on opposing sides. I, you know, I think our users need those. I think they don't need them. Um, so you're not really sure. There's probably a case for them to use it, but not 100% positive. And so you can have a design principle that says, when in doubt, go without, right? And so that doesn't, you know, if you were to look at your personas, that doesn't tell you, I mean, your personas, it, it doesn't answer that question, but a design principle does. So a good solid set of design principles is really helpful to kind of keep a, 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 the experience creation process going in the right direction. Um, I'm really just scratching the surface here. There's a, a, if you Google design principles by Jeremy Keith, he does a, just a fantastic job at, uh, at, at talking about what's, what goes into a design principle and, and how they work. In fact, I think he's got a, like an hour long session just on design principles. So ideation. Um, one of the things, uh, just to point it out, I've got this little accelerate tag at the top and so uh, the point of that is that I think there's ways that, uh, that we can accelerate design, which also addresses some of the concerns up front about selling design and some of the misleading facts about design. Uh, I think that if we can uh, accelerate and get faster, then we don't have to answer the questions of why do we, you know, or, or respond to the cutting of usability or cutting of design research because they're too expensive. So if we can accelerate and get faster, then, you know, Obviously, the whole entire design process is going to get cheaper. So what ideation is, is very similar to um, what IDEO did in the beginning, where they did the contextual research. They know, they, now they know who and, uh, who and uh, why, and they're all kind of getting together and brainstorming and coming up with um, a solution that uh, potentially works. The way we've done it in the past is um, we, create a, um, we create a design brief which is sort of a loaded word that sounds a little scary. A lot of people, when you think of design brief, you think a 10-page document. That's not what this is. This is um, maybe two paragraphs outlining the problem that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to get to. Um, 
and and then you you go around uh, you have you bring in all the stakeholders that matter. Um, if it's if it's a whole bunch, maybe you got to do a bunch of these series, or maybe the the duration is a little bit longer. We try to keep these to an hour, and at an hour, we found that six participants is the max that we can hold in an hour. And um, the way that it works is uh, everybody has this design brief, and all the people that are involved in the room are asked to sketch a solution to the problem. Um, and after they sketch a solution to the problem, they they have to present it. Say this is you know, usually the sketch. You know, I mean, you don't have to go be a good drawer. In fact, most of the sketches that come out are are hardly even legible. Uh, but they at least give you points that, that you can talk to. And so they present their designs, um, and, and after they've presented, everybody in the room goes around and critiques that design. And they give uh, three positives and three negatives. Um, and then at the end of that, you have uh, a document that, uh, that looks something like this. So, uh, I don't know, it might be hard to read. Um, but I'll kind of walk through it. So, you know, at one point in time, we had this problem in, in the Drupal Garden Steam Builder where uh, width and height, uh, we put that in there to control the divs and change the columns of things, and it was causing all kinds of problems. And so uh, we had a design brief that said, you know, we need to fix the design, we need to fix the width and height, but it's not a process of removing it. What's the solution that we would actually do to put it in? And so uh, this is only a subset of the people that participated. Um, but uh, it, you know, everybody went around the room, sketched just as I said, and, and, and as they critiqued, the person that did the design is inside of a Google Doc capturing the feedback uh, from other people. And as soon as you uh, hear something that uh, two people liked, it gets an additional tick, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it looks like the colors are a little off here. I can't really tell from my perspective, but um, you know, I did, I did this just for this presentation, but what I did was outline all of the uh, issues that nobody liked and all of the issues that people did like. And the great thing about that is, you know, when you leave that, you can at least know that you're designing something that's not going to the stuff that is just not going to go anywhere because nobody, none of the stakeholders liked it. You may go an entirely different direction, but at least you're not going down that pitfall of, of uh, coming up with designs against the things that nobody's going to nobody's going to buy off on in the end. Um, so task flows. I actually thought about omitting this slide. Um, they're kind. I mean, they've been around for a long time. But the reason why I mean I don't do them anymore. But the re reason why I don't is because mostly I'm working within a predefined system. Um, for example, uh, views doesn't really need. Ta task flows. However, when we started doing Drupal Gardens, the whole process of registration and how, you know, understanding all the touch points of registration, those had task flows. And that's really the main point of a task flow is to, is to understand the site at the 50,000 foot level. So if you were to like think of, you know, an analogy of Google Maps, uh, the, you know, the, you, the, the, the U.S. boundary with all the different states might be a, you know, a page flow. It doesn't give any details. It's just really kind of talking about, you know, the high-level stuff. Um, you know, some of the tools that have been around forever are things like Illustrator and uh, Visio or PowerPoint. But lately, there's been services coming out like uh, Kaku, uh, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, Lucid Chart and MindMaster. Um, I think they're probably you know better than the old school tools like Illustrator or Visio because they're immediately online and everybody can kind of collaborate in terms of what uh, what what that task flow is outlining. Uh, this is an example of a task flow I did probably like I don't know 12 years ago, um, and it's just a furniture exchange uh, connecting manufacturers and distributors. And it's for a given use case. And my point was to uh, figure out all the pages that were going to be involved um, and, um, and then kind of break out. I even started getting to this wireframe to understand what that might look like once, you know, once, once I actually did get to this phase. Uh, gray boxing, I think, is, is kind of a, a new term that's popping up. 
it's, um, in my mind, it's not any different than a wireframe, except it's, uh, it's, it's a conceptual wireframe. It's uh, for just kind of looking at a, uh, a specific page and trying to figure out what are the big areas that are important. And you know, you're using them to, uh, if you have a customer and you don't really want to get down into the weeds uh, and have them you know, you know, critiquing what a specific link says or where a specific link falls or the structure of a table, um, it's, that's what it's for, it's to kind of say, you know, these, you know, just look at the page and, um, and you know, try to get a general sense of what it is. This is a, uh, a gray box that was produced by uh, Floor from Chapter 3. And um, in my mind, it's actually, this is actually a little close, too close to a wireframe. If this was my idea of a, of a uh, gray box, there, you know, the navigation at the top there wouldn't have been broken up into, into five buckets because then you're starting to make connections like, oh, are you only saying that I, I'm going to have five links up there? Um, instead, I think it's better if it's just a single bar that says this is navigation. Uh, additionally, you get into these things right here where it says like block header, you know, and kind of gives a picture and the details and that kind of creates questions like, well, what kind of imagery are we going to put in there or why does it say block header? Um, if this was my gray box, it probably would have just been, you know, a feature goes here, a feature goes there. This would be content. That's the primary area for displaying, you know, major featured content. And what it does is it allows the, you know, the, the customer to, to at least understand what your, where your head is at in terms of how things are going to be placed. You know, where is my logo going to go, etc. Storyboards. Um, storyboards are sort of my sweet spot. And I think they're, um, they're different than a wireframe in that a wireframe by nature or by definition, if you were to look at Wikipedia, a wireframe is a, is a black and white skeleton of a site or uh, a UI. <clears throat> um, and a storyboard, in my mind, uh, can be that if it wants to be. But more importantly, um, it's sort of representative of the end state. And I think uh, we haven't seen storyboards around an interface design um, largely because of um, the tools that are available to us or the historical perspective of the tools that, are, that were available to us. So, uh, for example, in, um, in 1995, Don Norman coined the term user experience. So that was, what, 16 years ago? My, my math is not all that good. But 16 years ago. So the industry is really, you know, young. And 16 years ago, if we were to think about, you know, this user experience space that has blossomed into what it is now, um, Back then, there were just a couple tools available to you. Probably uh, Illustrator, uh, uh, Visio, and Photoshop, right? And uh, you know, when you're working with a customer, you need to iterate as fast as possible uh, to just churn through, the, churn through the different designs. And if you were to use Photoshop to do that, I mean, you just might as well just kill yourself. You know, it's like that would just take way too long. Um, but, you know, fast forward to 2011, and that's not the case anymore. Um, you can produce designs that are, um, that look exactly like the, the end state, but at the speed of Visio or Illustrator. And so I kind of think the reason why we do these black and white designs is, um, is just based on history. But you know, the, I try to move my department away from that so that you're doing visual designs and interaction designs at the same time, or at least you have that choice to do that. Um, so uh, I just lost my thought there. But um, here's, a, here's kind of an example. Um, so I've got this little test for you. So which tests and sells better? And so what I mean by that is that 
by test better, I mean if I was to put this design in front of you and ask you to use it, how well do you think it would test? By sells better, what I mean is if you are my customer and I'm trying to present this UI back to you, which one of these designs are you going to get excited about? Which one are you going to probably sign off on and say, yes, take that to the next level? Uh oh, I lost my uh, I lost my connection here. The Wi-Fi in this conference is out of control. Okay. So based on that, now that you know it, what I mean by tests better or sells better, uh, tell me which one of these you think tests better or sells better. A. B. So it's just, they're all the same design, just different different levels of fidelity. Or C. I mean, it's sort of a rhetorical question in this case, right? Um, if I put a paper napkin in front of a customer or end user, and I have done that, a lot of times they look at you like you're smoking crack. You know, like, what do you mean you want me to test a napkin? You know, um, <laughs> versus if I put something like this in front of them, uh, they at least make the connection that this is an interface and that, you know, you want me to do something in this, in this space. Um, and so, you know, because it's a rhetorical question, it, 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 it doesn't have a lot of value. Um, but bringing it back to what I was saying, you know, now let's ask that same question in terms of which one of these do you think uh, is faster to produce? A, B, or C? I'm interested. B? B is fastest? Is that the general consensus? Yeah. C is fastest. Yeah. Which one? What was that? All right. So I'll answer both of those. C is fastest. I was able to produce that at, a, at probably a 50% faster rate than I was able to produce B. A may have been faster if it was truly a napkin sketch that I sketched, that I scanned into the computer or something. But that's not what I did. I actually had a Wacom tablet and I was trying to draw this and I had to push the pen down hard to, to make it like show up. And uh, so, um, so, you know, if you can do this at the speed that you can do those other ones, then why would, why would you do a wireframe? Um, and uh, before I come back to your question, Claudio, uh, it was Claudio, right? Yes. Uh, um, some people may say, yeah, but it's black and white, Jeff. Of, you know, it's, we're not even talking about the same space here. But this is a wireframe, too. Right? It's completely in, in the end state. It's 100% vector based outside of a, a few objects. Like these are uh, some 3D rendered files that were pulled into the vector based file that allows you to still you know, take this guy here and scale it and change the text and whatever. So it's, it's pretty much uh, just a wireframe except in its end state. And when I present ideas like that, my customers get excited. Right? They're not looking at a black and white thing, and they have to somehow man mentally map that to what it's going to be. Uh, additionally, I don't, you know, if I don't want to go to my customers first, if I want to prove out the design, I can actually go and test this with users and then go back to my customer and say, guess what? N you know, this is the design, and guess what? It tested really well. Um, in terms of maintaining, uh, C is still easier to maintain. As long as you're using the right tools, there's ways to create symbols. And um, so, you know, I use Fireworks for a tool to create all these things. And uh, I'm constantly in Drupal. So the way that, uh, the way that it works for me is actually I'm, I'm constantly in Drupal and going back and forth between this site, even though this is a little bit of an older design. And so what I've done is I've created libraries of things. Like I've got a seven, you know, the Drupal admin theme is called seven. So I've got a, um, a seven combo box, I've got a seven field set, I've got a seven, you know, overlay admin. So for me, it's just a matter of taking the fields and dragging them on, so. 
Uh, so let me stop for a moment and, um, and show you an example of uh, the Views project. So this is, um, can you see that? Yeah. So this is a storyboard of uh, views. And uh, basically the way that I map all these storyboards is um, for something as complex as, as views that has, I don't even know how many use cases in it. What I, tr what I try to do is uh, first map uh, the general flow of, uh, of the 80% case through the tool. Um, <clears throat> which I'm not actually doing right here at this moment, but uh, you know, for example, I want I, I want to create the view. Um, I want to show uh, um, I don't know what's a good example. I, I want to show just blogs. Um, I want to create a page of the blogs. I want to uh, show the blogs as teasers, as well as I want to create a block of titles um, and be done. Right, that's a that's a pretty common case, or maybe I'm not quite done, but I want to tweak that view um, and add some add some various fields to it. Um, that's kind of the common case, and then you get into edge cases like I want to configure a table wizard, I want to add relationships, I want to add arguments, uh, you know, all the different edge cases. <coughs> and so when you look at a file of mine, I have it uh, I have it broken up that way, so you have a main a main flow through the through the file and then the various edge cases, and all of these are listed in one file. Uh, so let's get to the, so here's your list of views. Um, I've got some spec stuff on the edge too, just so that I can actually go over to a, a module maintainer and they can execute on against it. Uh, how you could v uh, browse different uh, code-based views. Um, select a code-based view. This is your creation process. Uh, this is what it looks like you know, on the surface. Uh, those look like they were a reversal of it, but if you say you're going to create a page, so you kind of like you're showing a sequence of events through a, through a different product, uh, different contextual fields, what it looks like when you get into the view, and uh, just kind of see if I can. Uh, what the hell? I screwed this up on a Mac. I want this one, right? So you know this file, what it looks like is. I've got the, jeez, I can't drag it. I'm lost without a mouse. So I've got these uh, different states. You know, I've got the main flow. I've got uh, other views, you know, table settings of what, what it looks like with the master query, what, you know, how do filters all work, how do the filters and or UIs work, all of which are certain task flows. flows. And then when you drive into a specific page, so all of these are pages, uh, a page has many different states, you know. So these are the ones that I was walking you through, all the different states. Uh, and this is this is how I create uh, storyboards. Um, and the interesting thing about this too is that um, these are all uh, ping-based files. So what I could do is uh, just export this, and they'd be immediately ready for consumption in a web-based prototyping tool, which I'm going to talk about in a moment too. Um, additionally. Um, I got that same Wi-Fi issue again. Sorry. Um, additionally, um, if every now and then um, I get uh, this stinks. Every now and then I get um, somebody who sends me wireframes or design mockups of Photoshop, and I'm instantly like flashed back like ten years because I've got a zipped up file, and the zipped up file is like three hundred megs. And I open up the file, and inside the 300 meg file, there's four wireframes. And I'm like, T -t 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 this file, which has, I don't know, probably something like 70, 70 wireframes in it, um, its its base file is probably something like 8 megs. So I can send this file around to a bunch of other people, and it does, it's, it's, it's not all that taxing. Another example, if I go back to my own, maybe I should do that just because. So another example here is this idea of a marketplace. So uh, 
Aqua has been toying around with building this uh, theme marketplace or a template marketplace. Um, and, um, and so these are some storyboards for, uh, for those. And note that uh, there's a slight difference here in that uh, the, in this case, I've consciously decided that I don't want to worry about brand. I don't want my viewer to be asking me, you know, why do the stars look like they do? Why do, you know, why, why are the links that color or you know, stuff like that? So I've tried to strip it down to the, to the wireframe approach, but I still consider this a storyboard because it's still task-based and uh, from this wireframe, I can I can scale up to um, I can scale up to the final you know finished result really quickly, and what I mean by that is um, even though this is in wireframe mode, I can come over to this uh, this uh, style guide that we have here, which has everything in here. And let's say I wanted to just start to upgrade my upgrade this thing really quickly, I can just paste attributes really fast. I don't want that one. Maybe I want links. All right, so everything just automatically comes up to a wireframe. I think I can even multi-select. Yep, and they all get adapted really quickly. Take all these things and then just, you know, really quickly I'm able to take this wireframe that I'd used solely for the purpose of stripping out this final result, but in a matter of an hour I can roll this up to so maybe probably even under an hour, I can roll it up to look something like that. <coughs> so that's kind of how I differentiate wireframes and storyboards is that it's, it's primarily, you know, task-based. It's a sequence of events. Uh, unlike a wireframe, you can't really, it's, it's not really a great tool to show how transitions work and transitions are becoming a part of everyday web design with things like jQuery. Um, if you were to kind of show what drag and drop might look like in um, and a black and white wireframe, it's not really helpful, especially from a user testing perspective. Okay, so the next one, uh, prototypes. So, you know, one of the things that we can do from a storyboard like that is export all of the different states, um, and because they're sequential, you, know, you expect that, uh, you know, you can just click, and you can, and, and, and if you're going to be, if your plan is to do usability testing, you can map out these tasks and have those tasks work to those master flows, export them out, uh, and then use some of these various services out there to, um, to start to uh, build these prototypes to figure out how uh, how it actually feels to work with. Now, you know, a lot of the services that are out there, they don't, they're not really super rich interactions. Um, they're good for, you know, testing basic click-throughs. If you have, you know, really rich jQuery interactions, then you, you probably want to use something more like Dreamweaver or TextMate and uh, more of a professional developer to take it to the level. Um, but I just wanted to outline, you know, what they are and, and why they're important. And just like the IDO video, if I was to lead, if I was to take that um, views um, design that I, the storyboard that I just showed you, and send it over to a, a developer and say, develop this, I wouldn't be happy when I got it back because sometimes just you learn things through interacting with it. Just like with that shopping cart, they learned like, you know. I don't know what they learned, but I know they learned stuff through interacting with it. Um, so I really kind of encourage this notion of building prototypes and kind of learning from uh, other industries. As I, you know, going back to that user experience is only uh, 16 years old. If, you know, if there's other things that, that have been built for, for years that, that cost a lot of money. And if we were to learn from those industries, you'd learn that all of them do prototypes. Like for example, if you were to build a, you know, some type of skyscraper, you can bet that there's a prototype um, showing how the sun hits it and what it's like at different times of day. Um, additionally, cars also really expensive. There's always prototypes built for cars. Um, so I think there's lots to learn from other industries in trying to build prototypes before we take them to market. Um, save, can save a lot of money. Ooh, I got it back. 
<coughs> so <coughs> now we know who we're designing for, why they have problems. Um, now and all, and we've come up with a bunch of ideas to to solve for those problems. We basically need to validate. And um, so I put this quote up here because I think it's uh, a really good one, which is, you know, an expert is a man who knows his stuff, thinks he knows the answer. Uh, as a as an ex as a designer myself, I I I follow this to heart. I really, I mean, I have some good ideas from doing this for a long time, and I have. I have some assumptions in terms of how things will work, but I never really believe that I know the answer. I believe that my customers know the answer. And so I think you always should validate whatever you're building. <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be working. I got it back, but it doesn't work. So how do we do that? Um, we can do it through moderated tests, which is what most people know by usability testing. And uh, a moderated test is just that. You have somebody that's sitting in a room that's trying to guide a, a, a customer through a specific task. Um, these can happen in a lab setting. They can happen in a remote setting. I've actually learned uh, through doing both for many years that I think a lab setting is a, kind of a, a waste of time and that uh, you can get largely the same results from um, from a remote test now, given the tools that are available to us, um, and uh, you don't have the problems that come into play with a lab. Like if you've got a lab and you've got multiple resources, well, you got to schedule around that lab, and so the lab becomes a bottleneck. Additionally, a lab is just it, it costs an awful lot of money. Damn it, I lost it again. Um, Self-moderated tests, uh, we kind of mix and match the two of these things. So a moderated test we do if we are really, really interested in getting uh, the right customers involved. You know, we don't, because recruiting can take a lot of time and, um, and for example, one, you know, I cover this later, but you know, one of the primary things that we use to find users is Twitter using my account or the Drupal Gardens account. And, so the people that are going to come in through those accounts are going to be people that are somewhat familiar with either Drupal or Drupal Gardens versus if I want to learn more about designers that, have, that don't have any knowledge of those things, then we would use uh, a professional recruiter. And then along the sides, there are these different services that are out there that allow you to do usability tests that are unmoderated. Um, and there are some problems that come into play with that, but there's still a great way to supplement what you're doing to, um, uh, to make sure that your designs work. So usertesting.com is the service that we use, and we use it because um, they have their own pool of people that are um, already ready to go. So all you have to do is create a survey um, so that you're soliciting the right kind of people um, and then, and then usertesting.com does the rest to try to bring those people in. And you basically set up a series of tasks that you want those users to do. Um, and they go forward and, and do those tasks. And the outcome is a bunch of recorded uh, videos that you then have to do analysis on. But, you know, it doesn't really take any of your time except for setting up the test and, and pointing them to the right location. And then all the testing and everything happens and the sidelines, which allows you to do two or three or four tests at once. You can have one big moderated test going on at the same time that you've got four or five or ten, uh, ten uh, self-moderated tests going on. And then there's these static image self-moderated tests. Um, this Verify app up there is my new favorite of all of the usability tools that have come around. Um, what a static image self-moderated test is, is um, you're basically taking a image of a page, like the Drupal Gardens wireframe I showed you earlier, uh, putting it up to one of these services, and you're asking them to uh, do things with it. You know, maybe there, maybe it's a five-second test where they have to tell you what stands out to them, and if they, if you present the UI to them and then take it down, you have, they have to tell you what what stands out. Or there's different things you can do with label tests. Um, Lots of, lots of stuff you can do there. But it's basically all around you know, a static image and getting feedback off that static image. 
navigation tests. Uh, so there's uh, there's this tool that's been around for an awful long time, WebSort, which was uh, if you're trying to figure out the navigation of your website, um, if the idea is to take a bunch of index cards and organize them all in such a, or ask people to organize them all in such a way that uh, uh, you can analyze and figure out what are the big patterns. Uh, it requires a lot of users to do the test, um, but it's it's good if you if you're not really sure what your IA should be, uh, you can use a service like WebSort to try to help you figure that out. There's two different types of tests. There's open sorting tests and closed sorting tests, and the difference is a, a closed sorting test is you have uh, a, a navigation in mind and you're trying to figure out how a bunch of people place, you know, various pages into that navigation and an open test is you've got um, you know people are just organizing it how they see fit um, a closed sort test you need less people than an open sort test uh, the other tools there I think are pretty interesting too tree jack and plain frame plain frame is uh, actually uh, a uh, child of web sort and what that does is it allows you to test your navigation uh, devoid of uh, the interface itself. So um, in other words, it's like all you're doing is interacting with uh, a tree structure. And you ask people, uh, like using Aquae.com, for example, we might say, you know, how would you learn about Drupal Gardens through Aquae.com? And they're not going to the Aquae.com site. They're actually just using this tree structure. And when they get it right, they say that they think they've found it. Uh, and that way, you can tell is it your navigation that's working or not working, or is it the site design that's working or not working? Uh, DIY testing, do-it-yourself testing. Um, you know, so I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that um, that uh, anybody can do their own usability testing. There's just certain things you've got to watch out for. Uh, like you got to make sure you're targeting your, the right audience. You certainly don't want to do a usability test with the wrong with the wrong people, or else you're just wasting a bunch of money. Um, you have to learn to be unbiased, and that is, um, you can't ask questions that have the answers in them. Like if you were to do, um, if you were to ask people and ask Drupal users to uh, find content. Well, the answer is given away in your question. So instead, you have to ask questions like, uh, suppose you created an unpublished article a month ago. Uh, how, you know, can you tell me how you'd locate that article and republish it? Right? That's how you can be unbiased in that case. Um, you have to do more listening than talking. That's, it's a really hard thing to do, but 95% of uh, the the job is just is just listening, and when they ask you questions, which they will ask you questions, uh, it's pushing those questions back on people. Usually, I tell people, um, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to push them back on you, and only when only when you feel that um, you would quit or abandon or call support, only, tell me when you would reach that point, and then I'll give you the answer, and then I'll just know from that it's a task failure. So I'm not leaving them hanging. And then the last is. You got to document patterns. It doesn't do you any good to like fix every anomaly that shows up. You're looking at all your test results and looking for the patterns that that show up, and you're trying to address those patterns. You fix those patterns, and then you reiterate and test again. So uh, another test for you: uh, which of these tests, uh, which of these UIs do you think tests better, A or B? A. Show of hands. B, show of hands. A, interesting. So, so this is from Jared Spool a while ago. So, I mean, you can read it for yourself, but you're wrong. B tested better, and B tested better because what happens is people uh, people try to sniff out information. They're looking for a specific keyword, and sometimes you can shorten that information so much so that the information no longer makes any sense. But one of the point that I'm trying to make here is a lot of times when you're looking at a UI and you're making your own judgments, a lot of times you make incorrect inferences in terms of what the problem is. And so when you look at what happened after this, it's really kind of funny. So, <laughs> you know, this is what the guy that uh, the customer of this specific test said. So 
It seems that business executives prefer to look at fairly plain textual content online rather than cheerful graphic interfaces. Plus, they prefer vertical to horizontal groupings you know, of options and longer, wordier, textier click links. After I thought about it a while, it made total sense. Users are trained to allow their eyes to scan down something that looks like search results, which was what it looks like. Graphics and images are not what the eyes trained for online. You know, it's like so. This guy has like he's made these inferences, and if he didn't have somebody like Jared Spool on there to help him through it, you know, he'd run into trouble. Am I out of time? Okay. All right. So um, that's all I had, I guess. So thanks.